You are listening to episode 165 of the Game of Slayers podcast. My name's John, and this week, I'm joined by Ryan. Hey, everybody, here at the Game of Slayers podcast, we like to talk about games we've recently picked up, games we're currently playing, and we go back to the mansion in this week's Inflation Deflation Challenge. So this week, we are playing a little bit of Day of the Tentacle, otherwise yeah. known as um, Maniac Mansion 2, typically. Is uh, it known as that? Yeah, oh, it is. Be- yeah, also known as Maniac Mansion 2, Day of the Tentacle, huh? Yeah. I, I, I mean, we don't have to go all into it, but I've never played like any of these kind of games, like point and click stuff. So this what? was like something different for me. I, I enjoy some point and click stuff every now and then. Like I'm not a big fan of the whole, you know, the narrative, um, narrative games where you just kind of sit back and it's just like the story. But the walking point and click simulators, yeah, pretty much the point and click. I kind of like though. Um, it's a little different for me, right? And this one was, you know, we'll talk about it more. But this one played out very interestingly, um, you know, in, in a style that I wasn't anticipating, and I really enjoyed mm-hmm. it. So we'll go into it a little further, but. To start out with our episode, of course, we've got our recent pickups. So, uh, Ryan, I see you said nothing. Uh, I, however, had a couple pickups. Yeah, so, what is Game Console 2.0? Oh, I will show you. Here, I will show you on screen. So, Game Console 2.0 is a book that uh, has... Uh, not excited anymore. No, 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 no. You are excited. <laughs> it has pretty much every game console from the first game console up to PS5. Nice. And it has uh, images, a little bit of history on each of them. And then it actually busts them open and you can see like the um, the inside oh, components and stuff. I love when they do those like blow ups. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so it's pretty cool. So uh, Justin actually bought it for me as like a late Christmas gift. And oh, uh, so it's, sweet. Friend yeah, of the show. A friend of the show. Yes. Uh, a couple episodes he's been on. Um, but yeah, so it actually was on like the Nintendo Gamers Over 30 page on Facebook that he saw it. And he was like, oh, I'll just go ahead and buy this for him. So it was pretty cool. I was at like um, a Barnes and Noble the other day and I saw this like big D and D book with like all the history of D and D stuff. And it reminded me of you. And I was like, I think John might actually already have that. Oh, I don't, but that'd be pretty badass. Yeah. Yeah. It looked like something up your alley. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and then the other thing I got was, <clears throat> sorry. The other thing I got was magic, the gathering cards, of course, um, finishing up that blue black deck. Uh, so as soon as I am uh, done with that, we'll go ahead and get some some playtime in and then hopefully so, unleash it at a tournament. John, what I mean, I guess we don't have to go all the way into it today, but like what are your plans for like the Neon Dynasty set that's coming out? Because like I think we can both agree that those are like the best looking lands ever. So with those lands, them. yeah, with those lands, I'm totally just buying 20 of each. <clears throat> or you know like i think they usually have like four total like types of land so mm-hmm. i'll probably buy like two i would most of yeah each well, of no one of <laughs> five five of each of the different versions yeah yeah that's my plan on that one um <clears throat> geez this uh this cough i hate it dude i hate it so much yeah so that's my plan on that and then i'll be buying singles as well for that particular set yeah i think i'm i think i'm just gonna get the bundle and ditch out on buying the set booster this time i don't know like i kind of want to set booster of it just because it's you know kawiyama and i love the kawiyama artwork and everything else is part of it Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the fact that's neon is even like cooler so like yeah neon ninjas and stuff but i wonder it's gonna be soon right like next month it's actually next month yeah so i don't know yet you know i'm for sure gonna buy singles that i need for the decks that i'm playing february 18th yeah and who knows it could like completely turn the meta upside down and then that results in like, you know, needing to get other cards. Hopefully the blue black is a good way to go and I can mm-hmm. stay pretty consistent with control. Um, and in worst case scenario, if I need to add in some stuff to green or whatever it may be, it's not too bad. So we'll see. Uh, I'm kind of curious how it's going to affect the meta. I haven't, I haven't really dove too much into it outside of like just seeing some of the art. Um, but yeah, so that's out. And then uh, I'm expecting the 2019 commander decks, all four of them to come in at some point soon. So we'll see when mm-hmm. those come in, but that'll be some pretty cool stuff for us to play. Um, I, I don't even think it's based off of a particular set. I think it was the last set that they released that wasn't tied to one of the like the booster sets that came out. So okay, 
yeah, I'm definitely interested to play those. And there's some cool stuff in there. And then as far as currently playing, uh, we picked up Rise of a Tomb Raider again last night. And uh, it was pretty cool uh, what we were playing last night. We um, we played, it was like some DLC content of the witch Baba Yaga, uh, which is like mm. the Slavic witch that lives in a hut with like chicken legs, basically. And so we were playing that last night uh, within Tomb Raider. And that was pretty cool. It was like an optional dungeon or not dungeon, but... Um, I think Dungeons and Dungeons and Dragons. It was an optional uh, tomb that you could go into. Uh, so we played that. Tomb, and... dungeon, same difference. Yeah, close enough. Um, and then what else did we do? We started playing a little bit more of a story mode, which is cool, uh, where it's going so far. And we found out we're only like halfway through the game. So nice to know. And uh, we're going to keep playing that hopefully today. And then I played a little bit more of Ghost of a Tale, which is that little mouse RPG where you are... Um, going through pretty much like a castle in prison of rats and trying to get out of there and they're imprisoning mice everywhere. Uh, that one it's good, but it's, it's kind of difficult to follow in a sense and kind of difficult to find your way. So is it cause you've been playing it so sporadically? I think that, but also the combination of just like not everything matches. So for example, this guy's like, Hey, you need to find this suit of armor. And it's like, okay, but first you need to go to this dungeon and talk to this rat in the sewers. And then he's going to help you create like this antidote or poison that you need. It's like, okay, cool. So you make that and then they're like, okay, well now you need to go and find a suit of armor again. I'm like, okay, who do I talk to? And they're like, oh, well the Smith might know the Smith's like, Hey, it's over um, at the ramparts when you're entering the forest. I've never entered a forest. I have no idea where the forest is. I have no idea where to go. And then like when you finally figure out like where this location is, they're like, well, you need to take the armory key. Okay, well, how do I get the armory key? There's like, they're like, oh, well, there's a rat that like looks over the old steps and you have to pickpocket it from him. There's like three rats that are around steps leading to that area. So you have to like pickpocket each one. And like, it's just one of those things, like unless you have a guide or some sort of video like tutorial to go through, there's like tons of people that when they get on there, like you read the comments, like, yeah, I was stuck on this. I had no idea what to do. Yeah. And it's like consistent through every single thing that I get stuck on. There's somebody else that's like, yeah, I was stuck on this too. Yeah, I I felt that same way when I was playing through Metroid Dread, because yeah. like everybody was kind of you know still playing through it, and I was like, okay, there are certain sticking points in games that the community kind of agrees on. Yeah, and and this particular game isn't like very popular apparently, because there's very very few uh, videos, and those that are existing, many of them are like old builds of the game apparently. Oh, okay, it's definitely definitely new for me i've never gone through like a game that has very very few tutorial videos if any mm -hmm. yeah so what did you start playing i started playing dante's inferno i figured i would get a head start on this year's inflation deflation challenge i played a couple hours uh i think that it's i mean i'm still super early in the game so i'm still getting used to it that like saving or punishing system is like i mean i guess it's, it's kind of interesting so far like trying to figure out like what route you kind of want to go down and <clears throat> it's less of like what i thought about with like a a little sister situation and more of like a per enemy basis situation so like i did notice you can kind of cheese things out by like repeatedly saving people because it seems like nobody will attack you while you're in that. So you can kind of just like run around to all the little guys, send them all to heaven and then just kind of wail on the big guys until they stop responding. Hmm. So I've been kind of doing some of that. Um, I only sat down and played it one session for like a few hours. So I definitely have a, a lot more to go. Well, it's not a long game. So you should be able to, if you do a three hours or so every few days, you'll knock that out pretty quick. Yeah, and then I'll be free, and I can just not play video games for the rest of the year with no pressure. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now I'm I've been thinking about like what else um, I really want to play. I mean, I guess Elden Ring is is really the next thing that I'm excited for. I haven't really jumped back into Forza, but I do have some friends that just started playing it, so mm -hmm. I might be able to check out some of that online. Unfortunately, uh, with Elden Ring, uh, no PS5 still. So like, you know, how are we gonna play it? <laughs> Benjamin got one. Did he really? Yeah. Where'd he get one? Uh, he got one through the like uh, Sony. You sign up to like get in line kind of thing. Oh, Sony gotcha. Premiere or something like that. I don't I don't remember exactly what he said, but they got one. Nice. 
Yeah, I um I want to get one through Best Buy, but I don't know how that's going to work. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, I want to put on a Best Buy credit card. So that, that's kind of my thing. Just put it on there, pay it off over the course of a year. Well, that's cool. Uh, good thing you got started on uh, Dante's Inferno. That way I don't uh, bitch at you the whole year. Right, I know. Maybe I, but I was like, I was so torn. I was like, I really should do you know, what the viewers expect and just not even turn it on until like October. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be a very Ryan of you. But I mean, it's on Game Pass, so I don't know when it'll be going away. So unless I want to have to completely restart by borrowing the game from you, it's in my best interest to get it done now <laughs> while I can maintain my progress. Yeah, It's so agree. weird though, like going on a Game Pass and, and booting up an old 360 game pulls up like, all the old 360 like uh loadings and like the like xbox logo that comes into the center of the screen and stuff like it's so funny seeing all that stuff again after so long yeah no i agree with you i uh occasionally i'll put in like an xbox game into the 360 because i don't have a one or anything like that and yeah every time i see the xbox logo i'm like oh yeah that brings back some memories for sure all righty Okay, well, um, before we dive into the articles here, which uh, we'll be talking about this week, PSVR 2, uh, Mario Kart 9, uh, Sega, and some NFTs. And then, of course, you can find us on all of those awesome podcast applications out there. So go ahead and subscribe if you haven't. Find us on thegamedeflators.com. You can find us on Good Pods as well as social media, at Game Deflators on Twitter, at Doug Inflators on Instagram and Facebook. And, of course, if you want to be one of the people that's super late to uh, catching YouTube videos, uh, from us you can go ahead and catch them on there i think i'm up to like episode 125 or something like that Ooh. out of the 160 something so hey I'm, I'm getting there i'm almost done uploading them all and hopefully we get to a nice cadence where like we'll every week up. every week i could just upload one <laughs> instead yeah. of 10 every 10 days so <clears throat> that being said first article is psvr specs how it stacks up against the original psvr oculus 2 and valve index this is uh tyler lyles at ign and so I don't know if you took like a, a huge look at like that grid that they provided, but IGN provides like this awesome grid that just kind of breaks down the original VR for PlayStation, the Oculus Quest 2 Valve Index, and it just has like a, you know, pixels per eye display, screen refresh rate, all that good stuff. Looking at all of these, dude, in my opinion, I would say the only downside to the VR here is a lack of built-in speakers, and which is kind of nice in a sense that it's not built in because if say those speakers blow out, what are you going to do versus like a headphone jack? You could just kind of use whatever you want, yeah. um, which is cool. Uh, and then, of course, it's still corded, which was very disappointing. But I do wonder if there's a reason for corded. Like, you know, well, does, does corded be, provide a better experience overall and like a lack of like, you know, because uh, disruption? Well, because if you don't do corded, it's like running its own stuff like the oculus quest is its own thing this is the ps5 powering yeah. a separate system so you need a cord to connect the two yeah no i know i know and, and you're going to get a better experience anyways most likely of a lack of disruption and all that too and um, i think the, the reason they don't have i think the reason they probably don't have built-in audio my guess would be that like they're imagining that if you have this, you're like the ultimate gamer and you've probably got like 5.1 surround sound going on in your space where you're going to be playing this. So they probably imagine you have, you know, better audio than what they would throw in there and also to probably cheapen the price because like the specs on here look absolutely great. Uh, it's definitely going to be like a top contender. Like obviously you can pay more money and get a way better set for like a PC, but in like the gaming space, it's going to be like top notch. The only thing is like a couple years ago when we were talking about this and I was like, Oh, I want to see a thousand dollar bundle with PSVR two PS five. I don't think that's going to be realistic. I think it's going to have to be like 1200 bucks for both of these things together. Cause it's like, mm -hmm. and you can't even find a PS five. No, man, I think this is going to be like 300 bucks. No, this is going to easily for the stats that this has in comparison to these other models. The Valve Index is like an $800 machine. This How is going is... to be if they could price this at 600, that would be most likely if they could do it at 500, that would be great. But I don't yeah, think that like... they can because it would be the headset 
and the controllers. Well, the Oculus that's Quest a steep task. The Oculus Quest Two is the Oculus Quest bucks. Two is a different thing. It's a no, whole I, different thing. I know, I know. But what I'm saying is, like, when you look at the stats comparatively between the Oculus Quest Two and the, uh, I mean, the only big difference here is the OLED. But the P- the original PSVR had an OLED as well in there. I mean, we're not talking. You don't have adjustable or built-in headphones on there. You know, so there's that whole component. Uh, Valve in general, I think, is just pretty expensive for most of their stuff, regardless. So the original um, PSVR launched for four hundred. So. <clears throat> They can't launch the PSVR <clears throat> two for less. Okay, than that. so let's say four hundred, which I think is still very reasonable. And P and PlayStation, yeah, but maybe... that was using PS three wave controllers. These are going to have brand new top of the line controllers that are going to think... come bundled with it. So, like you, even if the headset was four hundred, you're going to have to charge at least like one hundred and fifty for the controllers because you can't buy like a regular controller for less than seventy dollars now. Well, we'll see, man. But if uh, if it's a thousand bucks total, I'm game. Yeah, I mean, that bucks. would be incredible, but there's no way it's got to be if they're going to sell a bundle, it'll be twelve hundred bucks at least. Nah, man, I can't see it being that much. But uh, the one thing I did read uh, the other day is that Sony has yet to confirm if this is going to be backwards compatible with PS4 VR games. I mean, that would be so stupid. Every other PS4 game plays on the PS5. And that's what a lot of people are saying. But then they brought up there's certain games like uh, Hitman, for example, has a, a PlayStation VR mode and it's it has upgrades for PS5. Like you can, you know, scale up to PS5, but the VR component has been taken out. Oh, really? Yeah. So that's where it's maybe like, it'll be a per studio kind of thing maybe who knows but like i would love to play some of my ps4 vr games on there because i've been buying specifically for this for backwards compatibility yeah. <laughs> because they announced backwards compatibility of the consoles so it's like all right let's pick these up worst case scenario i'll buy a, a regular psvr and then down the road get the vr too yeah you know but that's you know another one is good luck finding a psvr right now <laughs> mm-hmm. so uh but yeah i mean honestly i looked at this i'm pretty excited about it i think it's uh it's got some great specs to it. You know, I really think it's going to be below $500. I would love to see it at 300 and Sony say, we're going to take a loss on this to get it into market to compete. Um, but that's doubtful. I can't see it being more than the console itself. There's no way they make this more than the PS5. I think that there's probably like, I don't know, man. I just... It seems like it's going to be wicked expensive and impossible to find anyways. I mean, I guess, you know, what? if you could buy it for $500 retail, that'd be great because you're never going to find it. Yeah, that's true. Well, there's a lot of things we can't find retail right now, unfortunately. That's just kind of the world we live in right now. What you can find retail and is always selling well. Mario Kart 8. Yeah, but this is about nine. <laughs> yeah, I know. So Mario Kart 9 reportedly on the way, this time with a new twist. This is by Anna Diaz at Polygon. So Mario Kart 8 is like the best selling Switch title and is like always in the top 10 sales charts on Famitsu every month. Like it's always selling well because everybody's always buying a Switch and it's the best companion game ever. So it's been, I mean, Eilis is Bonwave, and he's always making the joke, like, why would they even make a Mario Party 9 when they, or Mario Kart 9 when they just keep selling 8? But they're saying that rumors are that it could be on the way with a new twist. And, I mean, I like a new twist. I personally think that everybody would love to see the double dash mechanic come back as opposed to getting a new twist. But if the new twist is fun and new, I mean, that's great. I just... I, I've been listening to some top 10 like worst lists of the year. And I know people really aren't happy with like the new Mario golf game that came out and they tried to do like a new mode in there. That's just pretty lackluster and uninteresting. I know Mario Kart always gets like a lot more time and attention and probably polish than what, you know, the sports other sports games are getting. So I would hope that whatever they're going to do is actually going to be really awesome. You know, I have no doubt that Nintendo will add a Double Dash feature, call it a new twist, and just say it's a remastered version of the Double Dash feature. That'll be your new twist. Maybe they'll make a mode where you like have to like run up and put your Switch in the dock and disconnect the controllers and then run back. 
Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe, or it'll be like a giant version of the um, what's the cardboard thing called again? What, what do we uh, call it? The cardboard thing. everyone knows what I'm talking about. It's the terrible yeah. cardboard thing. Uh, so you have to build your own cart. Labo. Labo, yeah. Nintendo Labo Mario Kart. And you have to build a giant cardboard cart and sit in your living room playing it. Hey, that'd be sick. That'd be pretty expensive. A lot of cardboard. Uh, the other potential option here is... Um, NFTs. Well, <laughs> that'll be next. No, I think that we'll end up seeing is uh, this is probably going to release for a new console. That would be Yeah, I mean, or be at least a bridge game. Like, I mean, Mario like, Kart 8 did well on the wii u and then it did even better on the switch so i mean well, they could definitely yeah. release it as like a cross between the switch and the switch 2 i would hope it did better on the switch seeing as it sold like i don't know 10 times the amount of consoles yeah i actually you know back to the psvr psvr sold 5 million units i didn't know that that's pretty good it's not too bad for an entry level like vr that nobody knew about yeah so I mean, what do you I think it did a good job what do you think the new Mario Kart twist is? I was trying to think and I was like, honestly, maybe... I really do think I really do think it's multiple, multiple drivers again. Well, well, they said a new twist. Yeah. Nintendo with new, it doesn't exist. That's I, true. I, I think, guess how yeah. new was new Super Mario Bros. U? Uh, yeah. And like how new is Mario Kart 8 technically? I mean, it was basically like you said, a bridge game from, you know, they've added to it, of course, and they've done a lot more and enhanced it. But you know, but like, we what really would you kinda... like to see as a new gimmick added to Mario Kart? Uh, Mario also being the cart. Oh, my God. Transformers. <laughs> Transformers Mario. You know, honestly, I don't know. I mean, it's a cart racer. Like, why do we need to make, like, major changes? I think everybody wishes a Double Dash feature is back. I think, honestly, Nintendo should just bring that, that feature back to games uh, or to Mario Kart games. You know, or maybe have, like, two modes. Like, one is Double Dash mode and one is, like, single racer mode. Maybe like, you, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I mean, like just multiple modes might be a cool thing. I think maybe if they did something with like the courses, like oh. what if the courses like adapted and changed throughout like the race? I can already I can already see this Mario Kart nine, but with course builder, allowing you to build your own Mario Kart courses that you can race online. Mario Maker Kart. Yeah, something like that. Mario Kart Maker. I mean, they already did it with Little Big Planet Racing or Mod Nation Racers. I think it was. Oh yeah. You know, and Lego you racing games throughout the years. Yeah, I can totally that see Hot Wheels saying, game. Yeah, they're gonna be like, it's a new twist. And it's like, no, it's just another idea that's been around for a long time, and you guys decided to now do it. Right. Yeah, I could well, see that being we'll a thing. We'll see. Yeah. That that's my prediction officially. Double dash modes, so you can do double dash or single, and or. A Mario Kart Maker for nine. That would be pretty sick, actually. I'd buy into that. I could dig it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next thing we have here is uh, Sega went ahead and did like a poll, basically, of fans about NFTs. And this article is called uh, Sega Sites Fan Backlash and Surprisingly Cautious Take on Gaming NFTs. And it's by Kyle Orland at uh, Astra Kenica. Ars Technica. Ars Technica. I'm so bad right now, dude. I'm so out of it, but basically Sega went ahead and interviewed a bunch of gamers, not interviewed, but did like some polling to see what their thoughts were on NFTs. And, you know, I'll cut to like the very end of the article here, which was the big takeaway for me. And it says, and this is from Sega, we'll consider this further if NFTs contribute to our mission, constantly creating forever captivating, said Sega in the Q&A. But if it's perceived as simply money making, I would like the decision to not proceed. So. That kind of goes back to what we talked about, Barry, with NFTs and the trends to end. And I had brought up that, you know, with EA and Square Enix that, you know, it seems to me like this is a, a way to print money. It's a way to say, here's a collectible and we're just going to make a crap ton of them and you can buy it with cryptocurrency. You know, that's that's where I see this going. It's a very slippery slope to just additional paid content that is worthless. And like, yeah, you own the NFTs, but what value is it when it's worth pennies because you make so much of it? Like how many collectibles do we have now in collector's editions that aren't exactly worth a ton of money because they just print a crap ton of collector's editions? Yeah. You know, like it has to truly, truly be collectible. We're talking super limited. And yes, NFTs can be super limited, but 
knowing the gaming industry and knowing where these companies have been over the last several years and just, you know, with EA and their pay to win strategies on like Battlefront and such, what are they going to do with NFTs? Are they going to take a totally different approach and make it super limited? Or are they going to make like the same crap and be like, it's a collectible NFT numbered to like 4,000 or 5,000 type of thing? That that would be my my worry. And I think Sega interviewing or, you know, uh, speaking to potential gamers here with, you know, in regard to NFTs, I think that's a huge step for a gaming company. So, you know, what? we're probably not going to do this. And this isn't the only gaming company that's gone through this. There's other gaming companies that were going to introduce NFTs and they receive backlash from fans as well. So the thing is, they're not not doing it because they don't want to. They're not doing it because right now people are making a big stink about it. They just need to bide their time. Like Sega, they can sell a million Sonic games, but they can't make one that anyone actually wants to play. You really think that they're the ones that are like going to take a stand against making cheap money? Like, I really don't think that's a hill that Sega's going to die on. Um, And I mean, I... I heard this week for the first time kind of a flip side argument about NFTs and gaming that makes a lot of sense. If we could use NFTs as a way to like have provable, like retain ownership over like a digital like game, that'd be awesome. But the way that the world is going, they just want all that to be subscriptions. Like they want to sell you, like you said, all the little money making bullshit. They don't want to actually say, Oh, you bought a digital copy uh, Final Fantasy 16 here's your NFT code now you can go ahead and sell that to anyone else on the internet they can download it on their console it'll be super cool we got you yeah they, they're never gonna do that for us no dude uh, I cannot see it happen I'll be shocked if they do that's the only thing that I want to see NFTs involved with gaming is that I want us to have digital ownership the way that we could have physical ownership because it would be I mean that would truly be a step in the future We'll see. And I don't even want to get involved in it at that level because now you're trusting these companies with your, you know, crypto wallet and banking information, all this other stuff. Like, you know, their servers aren't reliable half the time. What do you think their security is like? You know, to have to to have to trust EA with all of your information? I don't think so, man. I'm just not down for that. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think Barry said this too. You know, it's preying on kids like they're trying to change the industry in a, in a manner that like, let's get these kids while they're young, get them thinking NFTs. So we change the gaming industry forever. Mm-hmm. And they're not a lot of these younger kids or even young adults aren't even thinking about the ramifications of like security aspects and banking information and, you know, privacy policies and whatnot. And like what they're getting into, they're just like, cool, NFTs is the big thing. Like Logan Paul or Jake Paul or whoever's, you know, buying whatever amount of NFTs out there. Like, let me do the same thing. I it's what's fresh and what's hot right now. And I totally get it. And I see what they're trying to do and they're trying to, you know, make as much money as they can, but I'm not buying it, dude. I'm yeah. Not I just, it. it's an iceberg. There's going to be some people at the top that make money. And then a bunch of people that are going to lose money. I am smart enough to know that I am dumb enough to be one of the people who would lose money. <laughs> so I am not going to go buy any digital apes. I will leave that to the smart people. So Justin, the other day, some guy was like, look at these NFTs I bought. And he was on Reddit and he posted like pictures of the NFTs. And so Justin snipped them and he's like, now I own the NFTs. Like, how dumb is it, dude? Like you're, you're buying original digital files and be like, yeah, cool. Like here's this thing that I now own and here's a picture of it. It's like, okay, I will copy your picture. And now I have it. Yeah, the future is a lot less shiny and nice than than I thought it was going to be. We're supposed to have flying cars by now. What is this? I did see a video online the other day. A dude like had like a hovercraft that he landed and it turned into a motorcycle and he drove away. Yeah, see, we need more of that. Let's get that guy on the phone and like, let's do more of that. Get him with Elon. That's what needs to happen. All right. So uh, that is it for our articles. We went pretty quick with that, dude. We did. So this is going to be a fast episode <laughs> at the rate we're going. I think both of us just don't feel too well right now. So it's like, let's bang this one out and uh, have some fun while we're doing it. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So uh, our game that we played this week was Day of the Tentacle, otherwise known as Maniac Mansion 2, Day of the Tentacle. I actually never played Maniac Mansion, even though I had heard such great things about it. Um, yeah, same. Just never touched it. Uh, but this was developed by LucasArts, published by LucasArts, designed by Tim Schafer and Dave Grossman. 
released in 1993 in June, and it was remastered in March of 2016. And it's a graphic adventure, really point and click. And then a reception is nine out of 10, often considered one of the, you know, within the top 100 best games of all time. So I, I can dig some point and click games every now and then. Um, Discworld would be a game that I've always liked. Uh, Discworld two, I still have to play. Blazing Dragons is another one that I've always enjoyed uh, in the past because it's got that that comedy and humor to it that I really I like. I watched uh, some Let's Plays of King's Quest and Leisure Suit Larry on the Game Grumps, and that's that's my most exposure to point and click, and I thought those were hilarious. Yeah, like I, I love, like the, the humor behind those is fantastic. I absolutely love them. And so this to me was like no different. This honestly, when playing it, I don't, I didn't read too much into the wiki on this one this week. I read a little bit about it, like the development and such. But as far as this game is concerned, it felt to me like Pinky in the Brain. Yeah. Like as I was playing it, it totally felt like a 90s Saturday morning cartoon. And don't you can't tell me that Plankton was not inspired by this tentacle. Oh, a thousand percent. Yeah, he had to have been, dude. Uh, So while playing this, I the only qualm I had with this game was that the lips do not match with yeah. the sound. That pissed me off because I'm like, you just remastered this game and you couldn't even like sync the lips and the voice. And it's not like it's not like it was the lips are constantly moving like yeah. before and after. And then it's just like it's stuck in that because it's like, you know, that's just a design style. You could obviously tell that they started talking before the lips moved and then they stopped talking and then the lips stopped moving after a little bit after that so it was like they could have synced it like there was clearly enough space here to sync lips and they didn't do it and so that frustrated me but the point and click component of it i felt was very clean um a lot of options you know with open door closed door use object pick up object etc um the hidden components as well so like having played these types of games in the past i know you know pretty much touch anything that you can touch so You know, like in the office, like moving the portrait and finding the safe or opening the desk and uh, little things like that. Like the gun on the floor. Oh, there was a safe behind the portrait? Yeah, dude. If you pull the the portrait out, there's a safe behind it. I should have tried that. Yeah. Like, you know, there's tons and tons of stuff that you can find. Uh, And then also, I don't know if you noticed a feature. I don't know if it was on yours or not, but on on, uh, the PlayStation 4, if you press up, it shows all of it. It highlights everything. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. I didn't I didn't do that at first. I forgot about it until I was looking for the professor. And then I I was like, where the fuck did he go? Like I'm looking all around this in for him and get to the very bottom. And then there's like a bulletin board. I'm like, I didn't touch that. And I pick Mm -hmm. up the paper on the to do. And it's like, I found the plans. I'm like, motherfucker. Like I just went through (laughs) this entire in trying to find like the professor and these plans. And it was like right in front of me the whole time. So that was frustrating. Uh, But it's cool because like this game, uh, for anybody who hasn't played it, you have these three characters uh, that hear about a tentacle that has gotten loose essentially through his letter. And it turns out that it was five years ago, that the main character, I forget his name. Bernard. Like Bernard. Yeah. Bernard um, Laverne and Hoagie. Yeah. He broke into the, the mansion like five years prior. And so uh, he knows about the tentacles and he's like, Oh, I got to rescue the tentacles or whatever. So they go to this inn where the professor is located and he lets the tentacles go. And a professor's like, no, you idiots, you have to, you know, help save the world. Now I'm going to send you uh, to a different period of time or something. And uh, you guys got to get all of these different things to help save the world. So he puts in these like porta potty time machines, which is fantastic and launches everybody at different parts of time. And they're like, the Corona John, he's like, does this, they're like, does this work? Like, has anybody been injured? He's like, no, nobody's been injured because this is the first time I've used it. And it's like, this is so (laughs) like, so nineties cartoon. And, uh, of course everybody's launched out and then his diamond breaks because he used a, uh, what did he use? It was like a, a reproduction diamond or something. Yeah. Something like like that. Yeah. So, or artificial diamond and it busts and like one person gets stuck 200 years in the past, one 200 in the future. And then Bernard in the present in which he's helping the professor to, to kind of get things back to normal and save the world. Uh, so I, I thought it was pretty cool in the little bit that I played, I played a good, I don't know, 45 minutes or so The game itself is only five hours at most to beat yeah so, and that's that's on like general play time i mean if you knew everything you're doing blazed right through it you could probably beat in like three yeah i was um when i started it up i actually started it with the developer's commentary just to kind of hear what that was like yeah um but i didn't have the 
subtitles on so i couldn't really see what was actually happening in the game so i was quickly like okay this is this is obviously for people that have played this before like i know that that's the idea behind it i just wanted to listen to it a little bit yeah uh, so i think it's cool that you could go back and revisit some of that i think that um yeah the the style and the vibes are so saturday morning cartoon like i just wanted to sit there on my couch and keep playing and keep listening to like the the funny dialogue and like the wacky zany like i feel like that's one of the things that's kind of gone a little bit different like is that kind of like explosive dynamic like characters not really sticking to like keyframes and being like wildly animated and stuff i think all that kind of like old school cartoonism is really awesome and i dig it um i've never played like any of the others like i know that they did secret of monkey island and that's huge um tim schaefer is also double fine so he did the remaster on this game with double fine and they're also uh you know the makers of like psychonauts psychonauts 2 which just came out this year and everybody loved i mean this is um the, this team and these people have like a long track history of doing like fun interesting you know this kind of cartoony style thing and i think it's important to have like some real stand up uh people in the industry that are bringing that kind of style like I would love to see, you know, a revitalization of this kind of thing in the way like, I mean, how cool was it when Cuphead came out a few years ago to see that like crazy old cartoon animation style like come back like uh, the South Park games, they look incredible. Like I'm a sucker for any time you can get good animation into, you know, a very stylized way because like better, awesome, more realistic graphics are always cool, but they're not as timeless. It makes me want to play Animaniacs, right? That's what it, yeah, I really want to play Animaniacs now, which I think is on the Super Nintendo, isn't it? Or Sega? I don't know. The Super Sega Nintendo? Animaniacs, Sega, Genesis. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I own this game, actually. So um, we, we should probably do that for future inflation deflation, the Sounds Animaniacs good. game. Yeah, because I'm sure there's some good humor in there as well, hopefully. I mean, there might be some audio or uh, talking. Who knows? Um, but yeah, so overall for me, I felt that this game, you know, it, it's digital for me. I, I had it on the PS4 um, via like PlayStation Plus. I must have got it a long time ago. So as Ryan and I were kind of talking about what to play this week, uh, it was just like, let's just go down our PlayStation 4 games and see who has what. And this happened to be one of them. Uh, but, you know, if you're looking to pick this up, uh, it is available pretty much everywhere digitally, and there is a physical copy as well. So, physical for, just on PC. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know when. When was the physical release? It would have been in nineteen ninety three, right? There's so also then, a floppy version. So this is the CD ROM version. Okay, I was gonna say because if you want a floppy version, go ahead and buy like the whole floppy PC setup as well. Because uh, good luck on that. Um, but for the uh, the CD ROM version. Uh, a loose copy is running you at twenty nine ninety nine, and uh, that actually peaked in January of this year, <laughs> and it's holding. And then the complete in box version uh, is going for one hundred fifty six eighty three. That peaked at one hundred eighty three fifty six back in October of twenty twenty one, and it's also holding its uh, position right now too. So you can you download know, I, this on Steam yeah. for like fifteen bucks. I mean, yeah, I'm I mean, sure it goes on sale semi regularly. Well, and like a complete vert, like. PC games are a little different in my opinion when it comes to buying physical. Cause like when you're buying physical, you're usually buying it for like the big box and the big know, box the PC release. Yeah. So, I mean, you realistically, that's what you're buying it for. Cause what PCs nowadays, I mean, there's, they don't really like, if you look at um, computer cases for like custom build PCs, very few of them actually have like a place to put a CD drive. drives anymore. Yeah, yeah. Like nobody really uses them anymore. So to buy like, a PC specifically to play this game like via a disc just doesn't make any sense. And then also drivers and everything else you have to consider uh, with being an older game. So I would say digital is the way to go on this. And, you know, 15 bucks on Steam, I think is pretty good. And like you said, Steam has frequent sales all the time. So, you know, you can see this on one of their Steam summer sales and, you know, probably be like, what, five bucks, you know, for this title. I think that's very much worth it. 
Yeah, I mean, it's got a great legacy. It's got a great look. Um, I mean, it's in several of top 100 games list of all time. Like, even the tentacle is listed in, like, a top 100 game villains of all time. So I think that this is not something to just pass over. It's definitely worth checking out and playing. Um, Obviously, I don't think either of us are really going to say that this is worth it for a loose copy for $30. I think that that's inflated. I think that the fact that you could just download it for $15 the way, uh, you know, PC Jesus intended, I think that you could do that. I think that's a much better option than buying this physically. And here's what I'll say for this particular episode, because PC is in one of those situations where a physical copy is more so just a collector's version. Like if you really wanted to play this, I think at 15 bucks for a digital copy, that's just right. Yeah. That's where I would be on it. Um, so do you want to put just right for a rating on this versus like the physical copy? Yeah. Like I know normally we do physical, but like. This digital is just right. Digital just right. Physical inflated. Um, yeah. So, dude, I actually kind of want to go back and finish this. Yeah. You think you're going to go? Yeah, I think so, man. Maybe not tonight. Like I'm I'm playing Captain Commando right now on the side as well. I actually forgot to mention that. So I'm playing Captain Commando on the uh, Retron 5 nice yeah so i hadn't played that uh since i pretty much bought it and picked it up to play through it a little bit it's actually Mm -hmm. kind of fun i'm actually enjoying it so um i I think i'm only like the third or fourth stage so i'm gonna try and finish that up tonight uh pretty easy beat-em-up game actually if you want to whenever you come over we could play that one too it's like honestly it'll take like an hour to beat yeah at most so we can check it out i don't have we ever done an inflation deflation on that game uh, not on Captain Commando, I don't believe. I don't believe so. So we could totally just... No, I don't think we have. So we could totally just play that one through one of these days. We should. Yeah, all the way through and just... That's our inflation deflation. <laughs> all right, cool. Uh, well, hopefully we are together next week. And uh, maybe we play Animaniacs. Maybe we play Captain Commando. Maybe we play Magic. I don't know. We'll maybe we out. play some combination of all three. That would be interesting. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this has been episode 165 of the Game of Flavors podcast. My name's John. I'm Ryan. And thanks for listening.